everyone. Welcome in. Welcome in. Good morning. Good afternoon. Maybe good evening as well. Great to see people trickle in. Uh, while we wait, maybe folks can let us know in the chat where you're tuning in from. And if you see me in, in my background, I'm in uh, TechSoup's uh, San Francisco office. Uh, awesome. I see folks coming in. Great. Hello, hello. Hello, yes. As folks are trickling in, I want to welcome everyone to this edition of the Public Good App House. We'll be showcasing tech for your nonprofit to unlock the power of location-based data. And give folks a few more minutes, but we'll also introduce um, our panel in a moment, as well as some housekeeping. I think we'll give folks a couple more minutes. Wow, hello everyone. Pittsburgh, Florida, Navajo Nation. Oh, hi, some, hi Matt from San Francisco. I know you, I know you. Awesome. Dunesmere, great. Hi folks, Strickland, hello, hello, welcome. Welcome to, today, to today's Public Good App House. Great, we'll give folks maybe one more minute before I get to a little bit of housekeeping. Great. Hi, everyone again. And for folks who are new here, um, great to meet y'all. I'm Allison. Um, I'm at TechSoup San Francisco office. See our high ceilings. Okay. Awesome. I think maybe we'll we've, we'll start here. We'll do a little housekeeping. We'll introduce the panel, and then we'll right get right into it. Andrew, if you don't mind me, um, let's go to the next slide to talk about Caravan and the Public Good App House. So the Public Good App House events like these are an initiative of the TechSoup's Caravan Studios. Caravan Studios works closely with nonprofits, communities, and local organizations, such as libraries, to design technology solutions and help nonprofits address some of their, mo their most pressing problems. And so it's just a little bit of housekeeping. So in terms of engagement, here's how you can engage in today's event. So have a question, please use the Q&A feature that's on the bottom of your screen. Um, you can submit questions and we'll get to those. Um, you know, we'll review those or uh, some of our panelists might be able to also answer them um, as they're um, going like chat function. Um, but please also um, use the chat function for any other things. We will be recording today's event. Um, also, please don't forget to check your inbox after the event. We'll email you the recording, the slides, and um, any kind of resource links in a couple of days. Um, also, as a reminder, the bottom of your screen has a closed captioning button. So if you do need that, um, you can turn that on at the bottom with the CC button in the Zoom menu. Uh, before getting to today's event, I want to introduce you to or welcome you to TechSoup Global Network, um, especially for those who are new here, though I think I see some familiar names. So thank you for, for engaging today. Um, at TechSoup, we believe technology like smartphones, internet connectivity, training, and more have the power to serve our communities better. Today's speakers with their Tech for Good app demos will give you a taste of what this looks like in action. So today's presentation, we have four panelists or four um, demos. Um, we have Emily Flinson from Esri. She serves as a nonprofit program manager. Marina Smith, um, she serves as a Map, uh, at Mapbox, the customer marketing and social impact manager. Uh, Munira Lakanwala, a director of tech and training at Little Sis. And Nick uh, Robin, Robin, excuse me, Robinowitz, um, a senior software, senior staff software engineer at Foursquare. So thanks. Thanks like them for being here today. I'm I'm clapping here. Uh, one more reminder that we will be sharing the slides and the recording from the, today's event. You'll see that in your inbox in a couple of uh, a couple of days. And also um, submit your questions in the QA 
and use the chat function on this um, on the bottom or the side of your screen um, uh, to share any reactions um, and kind of any quick thoughts. Awesome. So the first round, uh, first demo we have is from Emily. Um, as mentioned, Emily is an applied geographer and nonprofit program manager at Esri. She helps nonprofit organizations use GIS and spatial analysis to understand the ways that people and place shape one another. She believes that harnessing this understanding will allow us to take action, use maps to challenge inequities, affect policy change, and engage our communities. So thank you, Emily. We're so excited to hear your demo. Thanks so much, Allison, and thank you for having me. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, I'm excited to kick off the webinar today. Uh, this is a topic that's at the center of my work here at Esri. So really quickly, Esri is a GIS technologies company. We're headquartered in Southern California. We were founded in 1969, so we've gone through many evolutions of technology, but our mission has always been to advance the science of GIS, to increase spatial literacy, and to empower organizations to harness what's the geographic approach. Uh, to solve some of the world's most complex challenges. So a quick refresher on GIS. Here's our world and GIS or a geographic information system is a complete system that allows us to abstract and understand this world. Using a GIS, we can create, analyze and share location data and information like models or imagery of the natural or built environment, political or administrative boundaries, districts or other areas of interest, observations, project information, people, communities, and demographics. By understanding what's happening where, we can ask and answer important questions. We can identify patterns, we can find relations, locate optimal sites, and even make predictions. Fully harnessing the power of geography to make decisions. Over the years, the technological patterns for doing this have evolved from desktop workstations to servers, and now arguably the most exciting and accessible iteration, which is WebGIS. So that brings me to ArcGIS, which is Esri's core technology. Um, what is ArcGIS? It's a collection of tightly integrated spatial tools or applications that are designed for different purposes. In ArcGIS, a user has an identity and through that identity, they access different applications in the cloud. I wanna walk you through a few of the most popular among nonprofit organizations and, and share some examples. So of course we have our, our desktop software, which is ArcGIS Pro, which is now integrated into the cloud. This is a robust set of spatial analytics tools and data management capacities. We have story maps. Story maps are a modern building experience to enhance a narrative with images, videos, and other mediums. Um, maps bring viewers closer to the mission and nonprofits are, I'm seeing nonprofits use them for their annual reports, for advocacy tools. There's several really sweet examples of policy change that's been affected by a powerful story map um, and for communicating information to their stakeholders. Uh, I've asked the TechSoup team to share a gallery link in the chat so you could take a look at some of the story maps out there, the featured story maps that may resonate with you. Um, you'll see they're immersive and mobile friendly and increasing the time that viewers spend um, in interacting with content. They average six minutes, which in today's world is pretty exciting. Um, next, we have dashboards. Uh, dashboards are for an operational view. What's happening where? Nonprofits use dashboards to update executives on the status of projects, um, to get real-time insight into things like disaster response, or to organize information and make decisions. I'm going to drag over an example of a dashboard um, that's for a nonprofit organization to look at their fundraising information. So bringing data that perhaps lived in a spreadsheet or hopefully a database into a map because it has some spatial element, we'll immediately see, um, you know, see patterns ourselves. We're not even doing any analytics at this point. We're simply visualizing our donors. Um, and the map is dynamically updating, the dashboard's dynamically updating to tell us um, what's happening where. Um, if I zoom in on a given area, I'm able to drill into a specific donor detail. Uh, and that's just a really quick example of a way that a nonprofit can use a dashboard for development efforts. So back to our apps. 
we have several tools for data collection, whether that's in the field or in a disconnected environment or for a survey out to members, volunteers, or stakeholders. This data can be immediately fed into things like the dashboard I just showed um, because of that location element. Next, we have Experience Builder. Um, Experience Builder re represents the ability to create and deploy different app templates. Um, this is the key to ArcGIS, um, its configurable nature. But in addition to configuration, um, ArcGIS is an open and interoperable platform um, that includes tools for developers to customize and, and build. And finally, and one of my very favorites is ArcGIS Hub, which, are, which is our community engagement platform and open data platform used to connect those that matter to an organization and organize people around initiatives. Um, one of my favorite examples share on the screen here is this Global Midwives Hub, which is an ArcGIS hub that's used to convene midwives around the world um, for things like information sharing. You'll see they have their own open data portal uh, with spatial data around demographics, health coverage, mortality, and so forth, um, as well as a dashboard uh, embedded in their hub that's showing the associations and the members um, around the world. So really exciting use. There's a lot more to, um, to a hub like this. They were commonly used in local government for engaging with community members, but nonprofits have been harnessing hubs for a myriad of, of uses. So those are just some of the applications you can choose to use through an ArcGIS subscription, um, all of them included with that, with that subscription. Now imagine all of your ArcGIS users at the organization are connected to the same portal, um, to the same authoritative data, and you're all collaborating and sharing in real time. And that's how it works. So here's our apps again, just as a visualization. And in the center of those apps, um, is the data. Data is at the heart of ArcGIS. Um, you may have data living in spreadsheets, like I mentioned before, um, but Esri also curates data for all of our ArcGIS users in what's known as the Living Atlas of the World. The Living Atlas of the World, and I'm going to pull up one more web example, is a robust collection of data from all sorts of sorts authoritative sources, federal agencies like the census, um, live feeds from NOAA and NASA on weather, there's lifestyle and business data, there's maps for policy, infrastructure and environment. Um, the TechSoup team can drop a link in the chat so you can explore yourself, but I wanted to orient folks to one of my favorite places here, which is our maps for public policy section. These are the, the apps where some of those data sets um, on the last page have been brought together in a tool that makes them easier to explore. So if I launch our Maps for Public Policy app, which all of this is absolutely free with no subscription required, so folks can begin checking it out and showing um, showing maps like that have already been created like this in your work today. What's really exciting is as soon as you have a subscription to ArcGIS, you can bring this data into your own work as well. So. Maps for public policy, a lot of the, the information organized around different uh, political interests. So this speaks to our the depth and breadth of the Azure user community. We have hundreds of thousands of organizations with over 10 million active ArcGIS users across the public and private sectors. Um, because of what I was just sharing around the Living Atlas, and the space to collaborate around data. This represents the size of this user community represents such great opportunity for informing positive practices across sectors. I'm really proud of the 14,000 nonprofits that we support. Um, and we do that through our nonprofit program, which is a special program designed to get our offerings into the hands of organizations like yours uh, that are working on cross cutting issues like those that you see on the screen. Um, there are nonprofits aligned to every in industry that are innovating with GIS to improve their operations, their communications, and their impact. So just a little bit on the program. Um, like I mentioned, I get the privilege of being the manager for this program and have a small and passionate team of people that are um, working side by side with, with nonprofits um, to bring, bring their work to life. But our program is open to 501c3 organizations in the US. It's also global. So we have Esri distributors that are 
um, locally supporting uh, organizations in their regions based on their criteria. Um, but the program includes deeply discounted access to our core technologies. I'm, I'm talking about a 98% discount on our ArcGIS subscriptions um, off of commercial prices. So it amounts to something like $100 in the US for a user. Um, this also includes full access to the data through the Living Access, Living Atlas, um, through for developer tools, robust free training, um, support, and that user community. I'd be remiss not to show you a map of the nonprofit user community um, today. And with that, I'd encourage you all to, to join us. The QR code there will take you to our website where you can read nonprofit success stories, see upcoming events, and apply to join our program. And the very last thing I'd mention, just because we decided it could happen yesterday, is we're going to host a meetup in our Denver regional office on January 17th. So any of you that are in the Rockies region, anywhere around Denver, we're doing free lunch and drinks and hanging out with other nonprofit GIS users for the day. Um, and I will ask that that link is dropped in the chat as well. So please, um, please check it out. And I look forward to, to hearing from some of you. With that, thank you. And I'll pass it back. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. I love the opportunities just for not only Esri, but the other tools today, the opportunities for civic storytelling. And I'm reminded of just the, for example, mapping the the fundraising uh, and donations. So exciting. I remember 10 years ago or 15 years ago, I did everything in Adobe Illustrator, which is <laughs> not, not helpful whatsoever. So um, I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker as well, Marina Smith. Um, we, uh, Marina Smith leads customer marketing collaborations and social impact partnerships at Mapbox. Every day she supports and celebrates innovation and positive impact of Mapbox employees and customers. Before joining Mapbox, Marina led participatory mapping initiatives for land use planning, indigenous and community land rights protection, and natural resource management. Thank you, Marina. Wonderful, thank you. All right, let me just get my screen up here. All right, I hope you can all see that. Great, well, lovely to join you today. Um, I'm from Mapbox. Uh, I'm based in the beautiful land of Hawaii, but it's great to work with folks across the mainland as well. Um, I'm here to give a, an overview of what Mapbox is and some of the core products that are available to you if you're building with Mapbox and then ways that you can access nonprofit support. All right, so I'll start off by saying that Mapbox is not a single application. So my, my demo is gonna be similar to Emily's in terms of the, it's the platform. Uh, we are also not GIS software. We are a platform of products designed for developers who want to add location features to their custom web or mobile applications. So you can build a great app to demo at Public uh, Good App House. So either you're a developer who has never really worked with geospatial data, perhaps, and you're looking for developer-friendly tools that take care of the geospatial heavy lifting and are just very easy to build with, or perhaps you're a geospatial professional and you're looking for tools to help you build highly polished and performant end products like web maps or applications after you've used your GIS to do your data work. And the chances are good that you have already been interacting with Mapbox Maps. Uh, our customers span an incredible range of industries um, from consumer apps like recreation apps or news outlets for data visualization, delivery apps, you name it. They all look very different because of how customizable the Mapbox product stack is. So I'll start with our Mapbox Maps products. These are the ones most commonly used by nonprofits. Um, I'll call out a couple. Uh, Mapbox Studio is our visual interface for designing custom map styles. Let's control every detail of how a map appears. Um, I'll give you a little more information about that in a second. If you want to build an interactive map hosted online, then you would probably be using our Mapbox GL JavaScript library. Um, and that's where you would add in the different interactive features into your application. Likewise, if you were building for mobile, we have native SDKs for iOS and Android, as well as plugins for frameworks like Flutter. 
Now, just a little bit more on Mapbox Studio. I think it's a great place to start to get to know Mapbox. You don't have to be a developer to use Studio. It, uh, there's no code required. This is very much a graphic um, styling interface. It's free, it's browser-based. There's no download or license needed. Um, it's a complete design ecosystem. It lets you come in and play with all of the different core tile sets of data that Mapbox makes available to every account. And that's things like roads, terrain, buildings, satellite imagery, labels, um, that all comes kind of pre uh, available in existing templates, or you can build completely from scratch and customize to your heart's content as well. You can also add in your own data layers to create things like data viz, heat map layers, or add in custom um, locations, custom labels, that kind of thing. All right. And so we see nonprofits um, use Mapbox maps products to create high impact visualizations on the web in particular, um, a lot of data dashboards, um, Mapbox is truly optimized to handle very large data sets and still perform very quickly and very smoothly. So we see a, a lot of, of big data visualizations as well as things like um, care locators or service locators. If you want to build a very polished map experience on your website or in your application. That's what the maps products are for. I will give a special shout out to Storytelling Maps, building on what Emily shared about uh, the Esri Story Maps. For Mapbox, we have a scroll through experience. Um, this is available as template code. Again, you, you, if you're building with Mapbox, you're building as a developer. So you're gonna get into some of the coding, but it gives you complete control over this immersive scroll through experience where you can add in your narrative, your videos, and have an interactive map um, change dynamically as you scroll through the story. So I love these. They work great for nonprofits and for uh, communicating impact and explaining some of the complexities of your data. Okay, so now I'll cover a couple other suites of Mapbox products that, to be honest, are less commonly used by nonprofits, but I like to make sure that they're on your radar um, because I think there's great potential here. And I wanna make sure that people, when they think about location technologies, you're not only thinking maps, you're thinking um, location services more generally. So Mapbox has a full suite of products around navigation. And this is because we work with you know, uh, big companies that are automakers or operate fleets, delivery companies, for example. So if you have use cases where you are needing to say, maybe your food bank and you have a lot of deliveries to coordinate, or you have crews of people and resources that you're moving around and you wanna focus on optimizing those resources, Maybe you've got an out of the box app that you're already using, or maybe you've got some custom needs and you need to kind of graduate to a level of having a customized application. We've got the suite of products that lets you build that, or if you're working with a developer you're bringing in to build something custom, we've got the full suite. So um, definitely if you're curious about the world of navigation, come talk to us about that. We're happy to map our products onto your use cases. Um, in particular, I will give a shout out too to some of our navigation products that are more geared towards analysis. So for example, our isochrone API lets you create um, polygons, areas that represent travel time. And, and these are useful for nonprofits if you want to do an analysis like a catchment area of services based on travel time to a location or assessing an impacted population. Um, so you're not necessarily only building turn-by-turn -turn navigation experiences with these tools. You can also do back-end data analysis with these APIs. All right. And then our other suite of tools and products are around search and data. When I say search, I'm talking about geocoding primarily. So if you have say address data that's text-based data and you need to do geospatial things with it, at some point you have to convert it into coordinates um, or maybe vice versa. Maybe you have raw coordinates and you want to convert it into readable addresses. So that's what geocoding does. Um, also, if you are already using data in Snowflake, perhaps it's a popular data management tool in the cloud, we have a native app there. And there's a couple enterprise data products as well that I'll highlight for you. <clears throat> so we have our Mapbox boundaries data. 
This is a, a data set of over 5 million boundaries for political, statistical, postal, administrative boundaries around the world. Um, they're really powerful for creating visualizations as well as aggregating or enriching your data beyond something just like geocoding. Maybe you want to add uh, metadata about the administrative areas to your point data or do some point and polygon analysis. Um, this is a product that we can donate uh, to nonprofits. So come talk to us if you've got a need for highly curated data sets of, of boundaries. And then also we do have telemetry derived products. And so this data comes from uh, anywhere when someone's using a mobile application that's powered by Mapbox, we get some aggregated data, uh, all anonymized that can feed um, services like live traffic. So identifying areas of congestion or identifying patterns of, of movement, which can be helpful in a nonprofit context for things like maybe footfall analysis, looking at um, where certain landmarks get popular, maybe you're doing some site selection type work, uh, or perhaps looking at risk analysis, road traffic patterns for transportation. This is a big data set. Uh, again, we can donate and discount it for nonprofit research projects. So if you're intrigued, please get in touch. All right, and so on that note, how do we support our nonprofit partners? We have a highly tailored program. We don't have just a set discount for nonprofits. We want to hear you know, what you're building, what your goals are, what products you need to achieve those goals. And then we'll work with you in terms of figuring out how to make that feasible and make this great impact happen. So that ranges from technical support, mentorship, coaching, directing you through the Mapbox documentation, um, as well as discounts and donations of product. And also telling the story of what you build. So finally, just to wrap up, um, people often attend sessions like this because they wanna have that takeaway of, okay, why would I choose to use Mapbox over anything else? I think the main points that I see, um, nonprofits choose Mapbox when you are looking for developer-friendly tools to create something custom. You want something that is highly reliable, uh, enterprise grade, the level of what global companies are using. You know those services are not gonna go down. They're not gonna slow down. And you need that full kind of level of customization. Maybe your developers are clamoring for some more flexibility in uh, the systems that they're building for you. And then um, we also have this direct tailored support program for nonprofits that makes a big difference for a lot of our partners. And so with that, um, please ask your questions about Mapbox in the chat, happy to chat more and uh, get in touch. I kind of get off mute. Thank you so much, Marina. Really appreciate that. I just, again, the tools today are just so amazing. So I hope folks are feeling inspired. Um, if you do have questions, obviously, uh, around how to adopt the technology, please go to Esri and Mapbox, the perspective folks um, at today, in today's call and all the resources they've shared. I just love it. I know, um, I think World Central Kitchen probably partnered with Mapbox a while back during the pandemic to map out, you know, their they're giving in the logistics of of um, as they were trying to give out meals and all the kind of um, services they provide. So just in terms of inspiration for folks who are on the call, you know, how can you kind of think about uh, your needs and then um and, and 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 map those out and use the tools today? So thank you, Marina. Um, next up, I want to introduce, excuse me, Minera Lock and. Minera Lagunwala, Director of Tech and Training at Little Sys. As a Director of Tech and Training, Minera coordinates key projects and initiatives related to Little Sys technology and the program to train aspiring power, power researchers. She also, she also leads Little Sys participation in Crescendo, a project with Action Center on Race and Economy and Empower, uh, Empower Change um, to map the corporate power structure that profits from and is, is complicit in Islam Islamophobia. Um, thanks, Marina. I'll let you um, get started. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Take me just one second to figure out how to do that. Um, thanks, everyone, for, well, I'm going to stop that real quick. I think I have the wrong screen. Um, apologies. All good. Well, you found oh. the screen. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, Hi, thanks so much for inviting me to join. Um, my name is Munir Lukanwala and uh, I work at an organization called Little Sis. Um, 
what we do is a little different, um, I think, than uh, what many of the um, organizations that are on uh, the webinar today do. We're actually primarily a, a research organization um, that does um, what we call power research um, on power structures. So kind of um, our mapping is more relational. Uh, we're looking at the way that um, corporations and government um, are kind of working together and mapping the kind of uh, relational networks um, between, yeah, cor corporate corporations and government. Um, some people call it kind of um, corporate opposition research. Um, and our work is really focused on supporting grassroots campaigns um, that are kind of challenging um, yeah, corporate corporate power uh, locally um, and nationally in some cases. So um, as an organization, um, we're uh, known um, as Little Sis and that kind of, I can talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, our other name is Public Accountability Initiative. And our work is kind of broken into three, um, three areas, um, producing independent research, um, training organ or organizers, activists, campaigners in, doing kind of uh, power analysis and corporate research. Um, and we do this sort of through um, strategic partnerships with different organizations, as well as kind of general trainings to the public. Um, and then the third part of our work, which I'll focus on today is um, the technology that we create, we have created and provide for free to um, the general public to use to do the kind of research that we do. Um, we have two uh, te technology offerings. One is the littlesys.org uh, database, which is, um, we get our name from um, littlesys is the opposite of big brother. So it's um, a free open source research platform for uh, researching powerful individuals and um, organizations. And um, it's, yeah, a wiki style tool. Anyone can sign up for an account and, um, uh, use the database and um, also edit the database. So add research to it. Um, and then the second tool, Olographer, is our mapping tool, which um, is what I'll show you all today. Um, and it's integrated with the Little Sys database. Um, and it's a, yeah, a way for mapping kind of relational um, and power networks. Just a little bit about the history of Little Sys Tech, the idea sort of originated in 2008 and um, it really came out of this need that we saw kind of in our movements for uh, social justice to um, have a, a place where uh, a lot of this research that was like living independently on different uh, researchers, um, you know, uh, Google drives could be housed in one place. So it was a way to kind of bring together um, so that people, you know, who are doing corporate research wouldn't have to sort of start from scratch, that there would be a kind of um, database where some of the relationships would already be um, uh, recorded and um, people could kind of build their research off of that. And then in 2014, we developed Olographer, um, which is our mapping tool. And the name is, you know, uh, 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 two parts old. Oligar you know, oligarchs and graphs, so mapping kind of power structures. And um, and it became uh, really useful. We, we saw it as an opportunity to help uh, take the research that's in the Little Sys database and bring it to life. Um, and I'll show some examples of Little Sys maps in just a second. Um, so we have, you know, over the years, a really large community of users. We have, um, you know, over 16,000 at this point, um, people who are using the Little Sys database or have used it, have used the mapping tool at some point. Um, and the database itself has over um, 400,000 people and organizations in it. And um, yeah, a million, a million and a half uh, relationships between different entities. Um, so I'll just actually um, show you all a couple of maps so you have a, a better sense of, um, what the tool looks like. Um, so just real quick, this is uh, kind of just the homepage of the littlesys.org database. Um, the database is comprised of entity pages. So basically like profile pages on uh, on individuals and, um, and corporations or uh, other kinds of organizations. Um, 
some people have referred to us as the involuntary Facebook of the 1%. Um, it's a way that, um, and, and the, the data that's in the Little Sis database comes from publicly sourced data. So in order to add a relationship to the Little Sis database, you need, a, uh, you need to cite a source and um, users uh, use primarily uh, publicly available data to do that. So, you know, for corporations, um, um, securities and exchange commission filings, other kind of primary source material um, is a lot of what uh, users are at using to add relationships to the database. So I'm just going to show um, a few examples of maps. I know that uh, this tool is um, different from some of the ones that we have already looked at. So um, an example of the kind of map that a user might uh, make uh, using Olagrapher is something like this to sort of look at um, look at kind of who is giving money to uh, different uh, hacks or different kind of business associations that are sponsoring certain kind of bills. So this is a map that was made recently, um, or actually, sorry, not recently, um, to show uh, to show some of the organizations that were kind of uh, you know, uh, sponsoring or supporting a certain kind of bill uh, that was being passed locally in Florida. Um, and it's, yeah, a way for for users to and researchers to be able to kind of take maybe what might feel like wonky data or um, information that, you know, might not, uh, might be hard to kind of convey to a reader in a news article and visualize it and be able to share it that way. So it's really about like the power of visualization to help tell stories about the flow of money or the way that kind of power functions. Um, another map that was made actually early on um, in Olagrapher, in the life of Olagrapher, is this uh, map that actually went viral, I think at some point, um, that's about uh, the different banks and entities that were profiting from uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and so this is a multi, this is what we call like a story map. And that's uh, partly that's partly because uh, it has these annotated slides that help you move through different parts of this very large map um, and help tell this kind of like complicated story about how um, you know different banks and financial institutions are sort of uh, propping up this, you know, kind of environmental disaster. So um, these are, yeah, two kind of examples um, of maps that have been made by users and um, to help kind of translate research into a story. And there's definitely like more, uh, more examples that you can look at if you sign up for an account and uh, log into the database, you can, yeah, explore uh, you can explore more kind of user maps um, here and just kind of get a sense of, um, yeah, the breadth of research and um, and mapping that's happening on the Little Sys database. So um, I'll actually stop there. Thanks so much. Thank you, Manira. Thank you so much. Um, I just signed up. So I'm really excited to to log in and check things out. And again, there's just so much here around just civic engagement and just uh, advocacy, both as a knowledge creation tool, but also a knowledge sharing tool. So I th I just love it so much. Um, I think if for folks who who are in the advocacy space or just in any space at all, I think it's a it's a great tool to to check out. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm gonna pull up my notes. Give me one second here. I'm excited to also introduce our last demo um, from Nick Rabinowitz, Rab sorry, Rabinowitz, um, Senior Staff Software Engineer at Foursquare. Um, Nick has over 20 years experience in software engineering, data visualization, and information management. He's currently um, at Foursquare as a Senior soft Staff Software Engineer, where he works on web-based geospatial applications. He started geocaching during the pandemic and is unduly proud of his 711 finds. So thank you, Nick. Excited to hear from you. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Let me share my screen. Great. Um, 
Again, thanks thanks for having me. I'm here to talk about geospatial analysis with Foursquare Studio. Um, and before I, I sort of get into our products, I really wanted to take a step back and talk about why we do geospatial analysis at all. Um, I have a background, you know, before I was a software engineer, I worked in a lot of nonprofits and I found that, uh, you know, we often want to use technology, but it was frequently uh, not used for actually, you know, doing our core work, answering our core questions um, and, and supporting our programs. Um, I really like maps because they take this messy, messy world that we have to work with, um, you know, this, this hugely complicated uh, geographic space we work in, and they abstract it into these simple forms. They abstract it into points and lines and polygons. Um, I especially like the uh, the abstraction of the grid, where you divide everything up into these um, these equal area cells. I think we understand in the nonprofit space that abstraction can also be dangerous. You know, you can you can abstract over complexities that have real world impact. But that said, abstraction can also be really really helpful in giving us insight into into our data an insight into things that would be invisible if they were masked by the mess of the real world. Um, so that sort of brings me to geospatial analysis, and that's what I'm really here to talk about. Um, we use geospatial analysis and geospatial tools to answer questions and to make decisions. Um, I love storytelling maps, and I'm never going to say that, you know, telling a story with a map or using a map for presentation is, is a bad idea, but I also really love using maps to actually answer some key question, to support some program decision that you can't otherwise easily access. Um, this is most useful when geography matters, when close things are more related than distant things. This is a, a play on a famous quote from Waldo Tobler. Um, you will have some times when the geospatial relationships between elements of your data really matter, and sometimes when they don't, sometimes a small city is more like another small city and not like the big city right next to it. Um, so recognizing when you have a geospatial component can really uh, lead you toward geospatial analysis. And as you've seen throughout this presentation, I think maps and visualizations are often a key component of this. So Foursquare, you may know us from our early days as a consumer app, and we still do offer consumer mobile apps. Um, but right now, really our focus is on curating and uh, offering these rich data sets of geographic information, our movement data set and our places data set. Um, I'm gonna talk mostly about the places data set, which has over a hundred million different highly curated records of venues, points of interest, stores, landmarks, everything you might wanna know about in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, using both, uh, you know, machine, approaches to, to make sure this the data quality is high and human verification uh, to make sure that the data quality is high. We can tell you whether the store is open or closed. We can tell you what the hours are um, and you can trust that information. So that's you know incredibly useful. We sell that to a lot of enterprises, but we can also, I think, leverage that in nonprofit contexts. And then we have a variety of applications that build on top of this. And the one I'm gonna talk about today is Foursquare Studio. So Foursquare Studio is a web-based application that allows you to do geospatial analysis, to share it with your team, um, and to integrate it with other parts, you know, other systems you might have. You can integrate it with your own database, you can integrate it with your own geospatial application, or you can just use it by itself um, and upload your data as easily as dropping a file into the browser. Um, it's a place where you can make a wide variety of maps, share them with the people, you work with and collaborate on them. Uh, you can, you know, use either big or small data, whatever you have, drag it into the browser and, uh, you know, and start working with it almost immediately. So what I wanted to do was actually a quick demo of how we might use Foursquare Studio to do a small example of geospatial analysis that would be appropriate for a nonprofit context. So. So I'm gonna start with this sort of blank map um, that I that I put together. And uh, the, the context we're working with here is maybe you're a food bank working in Atlanta and you wanna find a new distribution point. And this is a place where you're really concerned about where there is a need, where there's uh, limited access to, to food. Um, this I think used to be called food deserts. Now it's more called uh, you know low income limited access. Um, but we can start by just looking at 
you know, where are the food retail locations? Where can people go to access food? So this is an extract of our places data set. It has thousands of different food retail locations in Atlanta. Um, and it can easily tell you sort of quickly where you can go to buy food in the Atlanta area. Um, we're really interested about access. So it's not just where the food retail locations are, but um, you know, we wanna really look at how difficult is it to get there. Um, as a quick proxy here, we're gonna take a one mile radius around every single place uh, that you can buy food, healthy food in Atlanta. And you know, we're gonna be able to see quickly that there are some gaps in between where no one is serving uh, those areas. Now, this alone isn't really enough to make you, to allow you to draw any conclusion. You really need to know what's the population like? Are there underserved populations here? So in this case, what I'm going to do, I'll hide this for a second, bring in our census data set. Um, we have a you know census data set that's free and accessible in the app where you can uh, look at all the census data um, on a grid basis. So this is the sort of geospatial grid I was talking about before. Uh, for any place in Atlanta, we can see what the, uh, what the total households are. This is drawn from the American Community Survey. And so this has income level as well. Right now, this is showing uh, total households, but we can quickly change the layer and show something else instead, like uh, income less than $20,000 a year. Um, and we'll use in this rest of this demo, we'll use that income level as a proxy for, for low income and people who might need food access. Um, we can now quickly, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna close this and I'll say we took it, I took an extract of that data because it's a little easier to work with in uh, in a geos geospatial analysis. So I basically just drew this circle around Atlanta. I took out all the the uh, census data that I wanted to work with. And now I have this extract that uh, that's a little bit quicker to work with in some of my other uh, some of my other analytical needs. Um, I can turn this back on. Oops, excuse me. I can turn back on the uh, the one mile radius and we quickly sort of see, okay, here's some some areas with many households that are not being served. Um, and you can just sort of visually quickly see where there might be gaps. Um, but usually the real advantage of using uh, geospatial data is that you can apply not only the visualization element, but math. You can actually do some calculations. You can figure out um, ways to look at the data that uh, might not be immediately visible to the eye. So what I did, and this is sort of a taking the cake, uh, the pre-baked cake out of the oven because I don't have time to go through the entire process, um, but it's pretty quick. And what I did was I joined all these circles with my, uh, for my food retail locations with my census data set. And I get this, this spatial join data set. Um, this is showing the total households. I can obviously, you know, I can still show uh, this uh, income less than $20,000 a year, um, but I can also show how many, uh, you know, how many places you can access. So how many uh, retail, food retail locations can you access in these areas? So I basically counted the number of uh, food retail places you can access in each of these little cells. And now I have this map of food access Having both of those together in one data set means that I can quickly set the kind of filters that I would want to set if I'm looking for key places where I might want to do some new intervention or new food distribution point. So I want to look for places where we have no food retail, uh, sorry, no food uh, retail, so uh, zero. And I've got one more layer that I'm going to turn off just to make this a little clearer. So all those gaps, uh, these are places where there's no food retail. Now it's showing us places, uh, it's it's cutting out all the places where there is access. Um, and I'm gonna add one more filter to, uh, to filter on uh, low-income households. So now if I want to, uh, you know, I wanna drag this up and I wanna drag this over a little bit. And now I'm able to filter down on these areas that have uh, low-income households and are not uh, served. Whoops, dropped my and are not served by uh, by retail areas. And that quickly, I've I've done a little bit 
I can filter more aggressively or less aggressively, but you can see it's quickly bringing up these areas where we have you know, a large number of low-income households and where there's no food access within a mile. So again, this is an abstraction. This is not going to solve the question of you know, where you should put your food, food distribution point. Um, but I just wanted to give an example of how you can use this kind of geospatial analysis to quickly get uh, an entry point for where you might go. Now you might want to go and talk to people. Now you might want to go and uh, do more investigation in those areas. But this gives you a quick way of understanding where you might look for further information. I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much again for having me. Um, Foursquare, I will say we don't have a fully fledged uh, sort of nonprofit support program, but we are really excited to offer free and discounted uh, options for our data and our applications to nonprofits. So please get in touch with us at uh, forgood at foursquare.com. Um, and Foursquare Studio, you can try it for free. And there's really a lot there that's that's available for free. So I would encourage you to go to studio.foursquare.com, try it out and uh, and make some maps. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. Oh, I'm just so super, super inspired. I'm an aspiring storyteller. So all these tools uh, and resources under the belt ugh, uh, in my toolkit is just amazing. Uh, lots to learn. Thank you to Nick and to all the all, our other brilliant speakers, Munira, Marina, and um, Emily. Um, a reminder that we will be sharing today's recording, the slides, any links that we shared in the chat um, in an email. You'll get that in a couple of days. I'm going to open up the um, Q&A and address some of those questions. So we do have a couple. Oh, one from Corey. I think I know you, Corey. Hi, Corey. Um, for those of us with, uh, who have little GIS experience, how do you address the technical challenges that come with learning geospatial tools? Wondering if anyone wants to um, answer that first. I'm happy to jump in here if, um, and others probably have thoughts as well. Um, I will say, and I mentioned it early in, in my presentation that in this iteration of technology that is web GIS, it is easier than ever to, um, to begin building that knowledge. It doesn't mean that uh, those of us that have GIS degrees are no longer relevant, but it is really exciting to see people that um, have been able to pick up and learn things. From Esri's perspective, and I imagine the others here have things to share, we put out a lot of tutorials through our Esri Academy um, there's a segment, I'll share the link in the chat, there's a segment called Learn ArcGIS um, that takes someone with no GIS background or skills through the concepts and, and the tools. Also, I'm excited to sign up there. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to add anything. Um, I'd add, uh, we have a collection of webinars and such as well too. Honestly, from the Mapbox toolkit side, the learning curve is more about development, right? If you're not a web developer or a mobile developer, that's more the learning curve. We take care of a lot of the sort of tricky geospatial stuff in the background. It does help if you are familiar with GIS fundamentals. So I would absolutely encourage you to use the Esri resources as well as the Mapbox ones. Um, but our MO is to try to make it easier if you're a developer without that GIS background. Awesome. Thank you, Marina. Um, um, there's another question from JL Hem. Which of these services is best for mapping the location of members by street address? And I presume these are members of the organization. Does anyone feel like, oh, go ahead. I mean, I can start, it's a bit to unpack uh, in terms of, you know, needing some more detail about how you're hosting your data and that kind of thing. If you mm. have your, like a list of street addresses, that touches on the thing called geocoding that I mentioned, where you, you actually need to convert those street addresses into coordinates. Some tools can do that automatically in the background. Um, other ones are specific, like geocoding APIs, so you get those coordinates in the end. Um, I'd say, you know, we, we have some templates and tools out there, like if you have, say, addresses in a spreadsheet and you want to get them on a map, um, I'll, I'll drop it in the link in the chat here. Um, we call it Sheet Mapper. It's just a little, little template. Um, but ultimately, you need to find a tool that helps you do that geocoding. One thing that we often do in this case, too, is if you 
don't want to go through the process of geocoding the the uh, addresses because you don't need the actual you know down to the house location um, you can often use the zip code uh, mm -hmm. as a proxy for the address and you know in a tool like uh, Foursquare Studio and, and many other tools you can quickly just sort of take the zip code use it as a geographic identifier and drop that on map and get a a zip code map of of uh, where your members might be, um, which especially if you want to share it tends to be more privacy centric. So that's often a good idea as well. Absolutely. If you are looking for something just like really simple and you don't have too many addresses, Mapbox Studio does have a data set editor where you can go and you can search the address and just add a point there. Um, so if you're okay doing it manually, if it's not a really long list, that could be an option. Yeah. I did see, Brianne, you had a question that Marina, you had already answered in the chat. Um, Marina, you had a, or sorry, Brian, you had a very specific use case around mapping out 40 addresses for a driving route and then another project where you had to analyze 50 spots and they were kind of like counties. And so I think, Marina, you had mentioned geocoding, but uh, you know, in terms of the level of privacy and things like that, that you would want to protect, um, just you know, questions to think about for, for you. Um, very, very similar to JLM's question. There is another question. I think we have the third one here is from Ariel. Um, which of these tools work offline or, for example, internet shut down? And I would also add maybe in areas where internet infrastructure isn't so good. I'm happy to jump in here. I mean, well, I'm touting the, the wonders of web GIS, we also do need to recognize that you know, there isn't, there isn't always internet access and in some places more than others. Um, or there are roles that people have where they need to go offline for some amount of time before they might come back into, um, into an internet connection. Um, we have several, several of the applications that I shared will work in an offline environment where they're storing data locally. Um, and that includes some of the data collection tools, um, as well as our pro or desktop software, storing data locally. And if you choose so later on to push that up to the cloud, you can, um, but those applications will still, still be functional. Yep, and I, I just added in the chat to um, for Mapbox Mobile uh, that is designed for apps that go offline, like if you're hiking, for example. Um, so if, uh, if you develop the app to be functional offline, Mapbox will work. Um, and then we do also have an on-premise solution called Mapbox Atlas, if you're concerned about firewalls or um, lack of connectivity. Awesome. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you all the speakers today. Really, again, very inspired. I want to now spend all day, just push what's set all my work and learn the mapping tools and all the awesome resources that you shared today. Only if I could, um, but I want to just also point um, for participants today. Share us, uh, share with us in the chat. What's one thing you learned? You can also tweet at us or not tweet at us. I'm so sorry. Um, interact with us on other social media platforms. Um, but um, really appreciate all the panelists and also all the participants today for your great questions and, and comments. Um, let's move to the next slide, Andrew. Thank you so much. Um, Yes, like what you saw today, I want to support a future demo event and reach nonprofits curious about technology. Please consider being a sponsor for future events. To do so, just contact Susan Tembe for more information at that email. And lastly, thank you so much to the behind the scenes producers. I called you out, Andrew, but thank you, thank you so much. And other staff at TechSoup who made this event possible. I see Matt, Corey. Um, last thing before we say goodbye, please make sure to complete our post event survey. You'll find it in the chat. Um, I think we bubbled it up before and we're, we're going to. Um, punch in the chat again soon. Um, you'll find it, uh, oh, it also automatically pop up that survey once you close Zoom as well. Again, the recording will be shared with you as well as any of the slides and any links that we've shared in the chat. So please expect that in the email in a couple of days. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you again to Marina, Nick, Munira, Emily. Thank you guys so much. I've learned a lot. I'm super, super excited to, to go down this learning journey. I hope everyone else is too. So um, round of applause and we'll end, we'll end here. Thank you.